Good evening everyone, time for another Bitcoin report. Well, we managed to hit 240 today on the Bitcoin. If you remember, my prediction based upon chart action was that we would uh, go to roughly 300 before we get the correction or crash, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's clear that we are in a parabolic move. But as you'll see when we begin to examine the topic of the night, whether or not Bitcoin is in a bubble, uh, the top in these sorts of parabolic moves is very hard to predict. Now, let's do a refresh here of uh, the uh, Clark Moody side, and you'll see we get a notice that pops up that there's a planned server outage starting at 10 p.m. Eastern Time tonight please plan accordingly. Uh, now that's very interesting. I'm assuming that that is an announcement from Mt. Gox that's being forwarded by this site. Uh, you can see that we have had a kind of correction off of that 240 high. Uh, let's pull out a little bit and uh, get a picture of where we're at here. Now if you remember what I described before uh, the market action with the rallies into new highs and then the sharp corrections and then flag formations rallies into new highs. Uh, we don't have that yet on this formation. So uh, will the sharp correction take us back to the 194 level? Uh, will we reach the ultimate peak of this parabolic move? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I picked 300 because of a number of factors looking at uh, swing rules and other things and uh, I initially picked 100 as the move with a correction you can see the correction only went back to 75 so uh, we're gonna wait and see it's very exciting and uh, but the main topic of the night we want to look at this article that's posted on the Von Mises site and that is uh, from uh, Patrick Corda, and that is Bitcoin, Money of the Future or Old Fashioned Bubble. Now that's interesting that he's juxtaposing the two. Uh, also what is very interesting is this is his first post on Von Mises. Uh, we'll see in a bit that I actually found his YouTube channel and what he said in the past. So I'm going to try to be nice. He's just a kid. I'm going to try not to tear him to shreds. Uh, but uh, I won't call this FUD, uh, but this is clearly uh, a lot of specious argument and uh, a lot of ignorance. Uh, so let's, uh, let's start to dissect this. Uh, Bitcoin has been all the rage lately. The stuff, or lack thereof, runs on peer-to-peer -peer technology, is fully decentralized, has no patents, and is open source. Currently, there are almost 11 million Bitcoin units in existence. The maximum amount of Bitcoin units that will ever be created by the logic of its design are 21 million. For more details on how they work, see recent Mises Daily, The Moneyness of Bitcoins by economist Nikolay Gurchev. The issue, while Bitcoins are designed so that they cannot be hyperinflated in name, I don't know what that means, they certainly can be hyperinflated in substance. Already there are numerous knockoffs such as Litecoin, Namecoin, uh, and free coin I've never heard of this one now you know that I've covered Litecoin and Namecoin and this is the latest argument that's going around uh, that the Bitcoin is uh, subject to infinite inflation because of the knockoffs now uh, if you go to my uh, blog you will see here uh, the Bitcoin channel you can see I have a donation in Bitcoins Litecoins and name coins. Now, there's a reason for that. Actually, think that uh, these two others actually have some value. 
and uh, that's going to be the main argument the arguments are coming out um, uh, and again the network effect is a big issue with this uh, clearly the Bitcoin is number one there's no question there's no disputing the fact that the Bitcoin is number one but again I covered Litecoin in the past it has some benefits in that uh, it is not subject to these mythical and that's a whole nother issue these ASIC miners which as far as I know correct me if I'm wrong but the the BFL butterfly labs they still have not shipped those ASIC miners so do ASIC miners exist I don't know but supposedly this Litecoin is not subject to that uh, the Bitcoin is SHA-256, the Litecoin is Script. Now the name coin on the other hand has another feature and that is DNS resolution and uh, the ability to uh, have names and that's a whole other thing that's very important because uh, when we look at the government's attempted shutdowns that we've seen it's usually with DNS and uh, actually anybody who knows anything about uh, the, the internet can get around that real quick but uh, so the main point is going to be if these knockoffs add anything um, will they have value now I think the market is starting to vote I think the Litecoin's between four and five bucks yes I have quite a few Litecoins and I actually have quite a few name coins I have some PP coins and some other coins and uh, I thinking that other people might think what I'm thinking and that is that uh, they will take their profits in Bitcoin uh, in other cryptos because as I pointed out in the past number of episodes I uh, want to obey FinCEN's ruling and that is I'm never going back into dollars that's the one-way street principle uh, I've gone into cryptocurrencies uh, again I started with a very small amount and that's uh, money you just throw away that's called venture capital and it's done very well but if it goes to zero so be it that's what venture capital is for. Uh, so uh, I don't think his argument is valid. I don't think these arguments are valid, that uh, there's an infinite number of these. No, there isn't an infinite number of these. The Bitcoin is, is divisible down to this uh, Satoshi, and that's eight digits. And uh, there's no reason to use anything but the Bitcoin unless something comes along that offers more features. Uh, and we'll address the anonymity issue. He's wrong on that. He's wrong on just about everything across the board. It's kind of shocking to me that uh, this would be posted on Von Mises' site. But then again, we'll see when we look at this that uh, actually the the uh, uh, Von Mises school or uh, Austrians, some call them, uh, they're sort of an orthodoxy kind of like the Keynesian so it's not really surprising I, I'm not a person who subscribes to any view of course as soon as you subscribe to any particular denomination uh, of a religion then you're automatically wrong by definition but let's continue and uh, free coin in its place this is particularly valid point because Bitcoin is a starfish ie it is fully decentralized as stated by Ori Brofman and Rod A. Beckstrom. The starfish doesn't have a head. Its central body isn't even in charge. In fact, the major organs are replicated throughout each and every arm. If you cut the starfish in half, you'll be in for a surprise. The animal won't die, and pretty soon you'll have two starfish to deal with. After the music sharing service Napster went under, Nicholas Zenstrom, the creator of Skype, stepped in with his creation called Kazaa, which had no central server that could be shut down. Eventually, such peer-to-peer -peer programs became more numerous, including Kazaa Lite, eDonkey, eMule, BitTorrent, etc. Now, most of you who are in this uh, internet world know that BitTorrent is the uh, premier one, and... Uh, uh, the uh, RIAA and the MPAA and the, the copyright police uh, who are uh, about as doomed as the horse and buggy makers uh, they have uh, diligently pursued the copyright violators on BitTorrent of course uh, to this day uh, they are an epic failure you can go to any number of BitTorrent search engines download uTorrent and find anything in 1080 or 720p uh, that is out there so uh, clearly their model is broken and we can see this with YouTube 
uh, if you go to YouTube and look at a copyrighted uh, work of music because YouTube is very sophisticated in its search uh, features uh, what happens is is that if someone posts a musical video uh, with copyrighted music in it then uh, they flag it they recognize it and then they go ahead and share the revenue so uh, I applaud YouTube for that that's a, a brilliant model that's the acceptance of what's coming and for that reason, I think YouTube's going to succeed. Anyway, back to the topic. Uh, BitTorrent has never been stopped. And if BitTorrent is a model for uh, Bitcoin, uh, then that's a very uh, strong positive. While this may be good news for people who like to download and share content for free, it certainly is not for people who are under the impression that Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation. I have no idea what he's talking about. Those who compare Bitcoin to a language neglect the fact that most people do not have an incentive to create a new language out of the blue. So this, uh, I have to say, and uh, pardon the pun, he's just absolutely babbling here uh, because uh, th there's no analogy between languages and the Bitcoin. On the other hand, a great chunk of human history consists of people searching for the philosopher's stone to magically produce gold. There can be no doubt that Bitcoin has a built-in gold rush mechanism, which has already spilled over to Litecoin and will be sure to spill over to subsequent knockoffs as well. Again, I've addressed this. Uh, no, it won't. It will only spill over if there's some feature that they offer money does bitcoin jibe with the austrian stand on money well frankly i don't really care i'm not really sure why you care uh, maybe that's your religion uh, the only way to find out is to read the great austrian see there you go there's your uh, dogma uh, had to say let's start with carl menger in principles of economics carl, carl menger made the point that money a general medium of exchange has always tended to be the most saleable i.e. marketable or liquid commodity of the time. What is saleability? It is not simply value. One may have a Picasso at home, which will fetch quite a sum at a Sotheby's auction during a boom, but a Picasso like a poem by Frederick Schiller or a work of Sanskrit. Why, why is he comparing it to a poem? Uh, I have no idea. Or decades-old bottle of red wine can never be the most saleable good. As Menger put it, saleability is the facility with which a good can be disposed of at a market at any convenient time, at current purchasing prices, or with less or more diminution of the same. Compare only the number of persons to whom bread and meat can be sold with the number to whom astronomical instruments can be sold. So, again, that's very confused, but let's look at the uh, Bitcoin market here again, and uh, let's, let's go down and look at the bid and the ask. First thing I'm going to mention here is this is the only 24-hour market that uh, I uh, trade, and uh, I pointed out before, gold and silver are locked down by the... Uh, uh, economic terrorists in the city of London and uh, so I find it surprising that the Bitcoin would be criticized on this basis uh, when it seems to be the most liquid we, we may have been shut down here so you can see the bid ask is 232 by 234 uh, so but back to his analysis so his criticism is uh, that the saleability is uh, very important here. Megger went on to point out that cattle were the most saleable commodity in the ancient world. This is perfectly understandable in a world where bare bone subsistence is a reality for most people and the structure of production is virtually non-existent. As society progressed, however, cattle became less and less marketable. Now, again, here is a uh, stunning admission of ignorance of history. If you actually look at history, and I'm going to point this out in a bit, that uh, these theoreticians, they're somewhat like Einstein. They're doing thought experiments about money. That's what the regression theorem really is, uh, that uh, it is a thought experiment. But 
We don't need a thought experiment because we have history. Now, if you go to my silver channel, you'll find out that the, the term for silver is actually connected to the term for cattle and herds. So the history of money, not the theoretical history of money that someone imagines in their head, like von Mises or Menger or Hobbes in the political sphere, but the actual historical reality is that it went from cattle to silver. And uh, that's a verifiable fact. As civilization progressed, Menger states that, quote, peoples who were led to adopt a copper standard as a result of the material circumstances under which their economy developed passed on from the less precious metals to the more precious ones, from copper to iron, silver, and gold, with the further development of civilization, and especially with the geographical extension of commerce. So, again, here you have a quotation of a, uh, a theoretician who's talking about uh, as Hobbes did with politics, you're talking about a theory, but we have history, and that's not true. Uh, we didn't have copper. Money didn't originate in copper, and it certainly didn't originate in iron. It originated in silver. Uh, the transition was from cattle and, and herds to silver. So, again, a bogus argument. Gold won out due to a variety of reasons, such as being durable, amalgamable, malleable, divisible, homogeneous, and rare. No, gold did not win out. Silver won out. So you're wrong. Yet the ultimate reason that gold won out is because it was the most saleable of commodities as Menger went on to write. Gold nuggets extracted from the sands of the Ernos River by dirty Transylvanian gypsy are just as saleable in his hands as in the hands of the owner of the gold mine, provided the gypsy knows where to find the right market for his commodity. Well, that's interesting. So you have to find a right market for your commodity. Where do you take your gold today? To uh, the guys that uh, we buy gold that are going to rip you off 20%. Or maybe the coin store that uh, is open uh, maybe five days a week if you're lucky. So that pretty much gives that away. Gold nuggets can pass through any number of hands without any decrease whatsoever in marketability. But articles of clothing, bedding, prepared foods, etc. would be suspect and almost unsaleable or at any rate, of greatly depreciated value in the hands of the gypsy, even if they had not been used by him, and even if he had from the beginning acquired them, only with the intention of passing them on in exchange. So you notice here he doesn't mention silver. Hmm, why is that? This leads us to another criticism of Bitcoin. It can never be the most saleable good. The reason for this is quite simple. Until the majority of the 7 billion people or so that inhabit this planet have either a smartphone or frequent access to the internet, a digital currency is out of the question. Now that's just silly. Uh, do the majority of the people on earth have access to a coin store? Is he actually trying to argue that gold is superior to Bitcoin in this sense? That is silly. Uh, if you look at what's going on in Africa, uh, there are uh, phones all over the place. And uh, the Africans are some of the most advanced users of, uh, of uh, phones we have on the planet, yet they have some of the uh, lowest levels of economy. So I don't even know what the guy's talking about here. This is, this is just plain silly. Gold, on the other hand, is easily recognizable as opposed to silver that may be mistaken for other metals such as nickel. Again, what is he talking about? Uh, moreover, it melts at a relatively low temperature and is relatively soft metal, which provides superior amalgamation and partly explains why it historically won out over metals such as platinum. No, that's nonsense. Uh, it, there's a lot of reasons why gold is money and platinum is not, and uh, that's not the reason. If one questions the role of gold in the present monetary system, one only has to walk down the street in a metropolitan area and see a We Buy Gold sign. Moreover, central banks hold gold, lots of it. They do not hold cattle, wheat, soybean, soybeans, copper, silver, or bitcoins. Okay, now I don't know if this guy's seen the videos of the guy who walks around and tries to sell people a gold coin for 10 bucks that's worth about 1600 bucks 
and they refuse to buy it. But uh, apparently, uh, Mr. Corda is living in a universe populated by his own mind because uh, gold is not anywhere near as saleable as uh, Bitcoin is. That is ridiculous. Uh, Menger also wrote, I'm ready to admit that under highly developed conditions of trade, money is regarded by many economizing men only as a token, but it's quite certain that this illusion would immediately be dispelled if the character of coins as quantities of industrial raw materials were lost. Okay, so what he's saying is, if gold lost its fundamental nature, uh, then it would immediately lose its value as money. Now that is patently false because gold is not used for any of its fundamental qualities, uh, whether that be for jewelry or anything else. It is used almost strictly as money right now. I agree with him. It's uh, used by the central banks, but uh, the reason why silver is not used by the central banks has nothing to do with uh, its fundamental qualities, which match all of the fundamental qualities that gold have. It has to do with the conspiracy against silver. So let's continue. While it may be, while, while it may very well be true that some early adopters valued Bitcoin with a Menger described as imaginary value, the point of the most saleable good bears repeating, gold is and has been seen as an object of beauty since the dawn of civilization. Well, so is silver. And silver also has uh, anti-biocide features and other things which have emerged recently, the electronic uh, application. So that's nonsense. Thus, the argument that Bitcoins are in accord with the regression theorem. Now, here's the religion of these Austrians. Because a handful of people consume them as they would a Picasso is like saying paper money has value because John Law or Ben Bernanke really enjoy playing Monopoly. No. Uh, no, that's not true. Uh, it uh, has money. It has value as money because it's legal tender because the law states you have to accept it as an extinguisher of debt. In fact, we might as well say that alchemy works considering that a significant amount of human history and energy was spent in attempting to find the philosopher's stone. Now he's quoting the labor theory of value. I don't know why an Austrian would quote, quote that. Of course, he's completely clueless. Some people may enjoy work just for the sake of working. Unfortunately, this is not a sufficient justification for slavery nor the labor theory of value. Okay, so he now he, he thinks he's dispatched with Bitcoin here. Can you see that? He, he, he has <laughs> convinced himself that he's made some kind of argument. He's made, he's made no arguments whatsoever. Uh, he's uh, just uh, completely failed. So let's go to anonymity. With the imminent hyperinflation meme fading away, what? What's he talking about? Uh, is he is he an Austrian? Uh, that doesn't fit with Austrian themes. Uh, where does he get that? Where does he get the idea that there won't be a hyperinflation? I, I, maybe he's referring to Cyprus. I don't know, but uh, I have my doubts as to his uh, credentials as an Austrian. With the imminent hyperinflation meme fading away and no longer holding much water, the new reason to hold Bitcoins is the anonymity, nay, the freedom that it provides. Want to gamble online or buy something illegal? Bitcoins are the solution. It's a way of circumventing the authorities and uplifting free and voluntary trade, or so goes the story. Unfortunately for many of the misinformed, the reality, Toto Keolo, or however you pronounce it, it would be best... To take it from Bitcoin developer Jeff Garzak himself, you can watch the video. The ironic part about this is that anyone and everyone who has participated in illegal activity using Bitcoins, presumably because they thought it was anonymous, now has a permanent record of every single one of their transactions contained in the public ledger. Now, uh, I don't expect all of you to know that much about Bitcoin, but if you know anything about Bitcoin, you know that what he's talking about is complete nonsense. The public ledger of Bitcoin is the blockchain. What that shows you is which transactions have uh, received uh, Bitcoins from different addresses. There's no connection between the blockchain and private individuals. It's just simply a public ledger. It doesn't identify who the person is. Now, I'm identified. You can donate by my address. It hasn't changed. It's my Bitcoin address. So you can know if you research my YouTube blog, 
Bitcoin address uh, that stayed the same. You can check that in the Wayback Machine that uh, I'm not trying to change my address and hide who I am for Bitcoin donations. You can see exactly how many donations I've received. Nevertheless, if I decided to, I could use a, a different address for every transaction. Uh, so there's no connection unless you choose to make a connection between your public identity and uh, these addresses. So again, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Those who think they're clever by using add-ons such as Tor are just as foolish as those who think prepaid cards or smartphones are anonymous. I, I don't, he just asserts that he doesn't know what he's talking about. Imagine if Bitcoins existed 50 years ago. Chances are none of the last three presidents, including Barack Obama, would have run for office. What does that mean? That no one knows. He's babbling. Bubble time. The question left to be answered is whether or not Bitcoin is once again taking the shape of a bubble. The answer is yes. There is present a reflexive pattern of people buying because prices are rising and prices rising because people are buying the myopic are extrapolating the price trend of the past four months which they deem is normal and so doing they exacerbate it to the upside thus attracting even greater fools so let's look at that here let's look at the Bitcoin price now if you remember I covered the uh, just recently the amount of bitcoins for sale so if we go to the display and let's just do them uh, group by price and uh, well it's actually dead so uh, they've got it turned down but I can tell you because I did the analysis earlier that uh, as of yesterday or the day whenever I did that uh, we had about 20,000, or I'm sorry, 40,000 Bitcoins for sale with about demand for 100,000 or so. Today we have about 20,000 with this massive move. Uh, so that's not accurate at all. Now, I agree that we're in a parabolic spike. And I also agree that parabolic spikes tend to end in crashes. But the big question is going to be, where does that crash occur? Now, before we get to that, I want to show you, we actually have a channel from Patrick Corda. This is his YouTube channel. And he actually did a video called Why Silver is a Bubble and Gold is Not. So now we have our second indication that Patrick is an FOFOA type gold buck. Uh, he's anti-silver and he's anti-Bitcoin. Hmm, makes you wonder. Uh, anyway, parabolic moves do not end well this time is not different so if we scroll down and look at the comments we'll find out from this comment uh, where he is responding to another comment Patrick says I'm not missing anything I was an owner of silver who did his homework instead of just listening to the parrots I would agree that silver is a tiny market and was a manipulated but to the upside ie it was a pump and dump scheme like bitcoins which many silver bugs got sucked into there is a fundamental difference between gold and silver and one is a monetary metal the other is an industrial metal the prices will soon bear this out okay so he called a top in silver supposedly uh, if you look at the date of this yeah it's August 1st no he called the top after it topped so but anyway you can see that he said also at that time that Bitcoin was a pump and dump it was a bubble so let's go back and look at the chart and here's the point where he said it was a bubble when we hit 32 yes we did have a correction in fact we had a 90 percent correction but now look at what has happened now what does he have to say because he's already called Bitcoin a bubble uh, so now if Bitcoin corrects back to 125 from here and then levels was he right uh, and uh, we'll see when we look here let's look at the chart of Microsoft now I don't think anybody can disagree with the idea that Microsoft is a game changer in the history of the world uh, I can pull up some other charts I can pull up the Cisco chart and uh, I can pull up uh, other charts that show these similar patterns Apple not quite as much but it's very clear that Microsoft was a game changer. The uh, 
uh, vision that Bill Gates and company had, uh, regardless of what you think about them and their shenanigans that they did, was that software, not hardware, uh, is going to be the wave of the future. Uh, they actually saw that. They saw it early. They invested in it, and uh, they were rewarded. So if we look at the price, if we go all the way back, you can see I'm not going to do that, but it goes to $0.09. Cents. So the run in Microsoft was from about $0.09 cents to about $60. Bucks. Uh, that's about a 333-fold increase. Now, what's interesting about this parabola, now there's no question this is a parabola, and there's no question that it crashed. But what's interesting about this parabola is that after it crashed, it stabilized at 50% of its high. So Microsoft ran roughly to 60 and is now at 30 many, many years later. In fact, more than a decade later, it is stabilized. So if you take the price of Microsoft at $0.09 cents and the current price at $30, you can see it is stabilized at a tremendous run. Uh, so that's going to be the big question with Bitcoin. It's not that Bitcoin is or is not in a parabolic rise. Bitcoin is clearly in a parabolic rise. Now, I called 300 as being a top before we get a correction. I may be wrong. It may be 600. It may be 2,000. It may be 5,000. Uh, but it's possible that when the top of this parabolic rise is reached, that we will get a crash and that crash will overcorrect and then stabilize at 50% of the price. So if Bitcoin runs to 1,000, it's quite possible it will come back and stabilize at 500. And if that is the case, not only was Patrick wrong here, but he's wrong here as well. And we'll talk to you next time.